In the history of Western painting, there are a number of paintings so well known that they have become part of the popular culture. In English painting, two images have achieved this highest degree of familiarity. One is a landscape, the Haywain, created by John Constable in 1821. The other is a portrait from half a century earlier, an image of a young man known as the Blue Boy. This is, without doubt, the best-known achievement of Thomas Gainsborough. Gainsborough was the greatest English portraitist of the 18th century, rivaled only by Joshua Reynolds. Gainsborough's most famous portrait was believed to result from an artistic disagreement with his fellow Englishman. But Gainsborough's real passion lay outside the business of painting portraits. All through his life, his real love was painting landscapes. In both genres, he would prove himself a true English master. Born in 1727 in the market town of Sudbury, Gainsborough was brought up in this house, which is now devoted to his memory. His childhood years are something of a mystery, but by 1740, at the age of just 13, Gainsborough was on his way to London to train as a painter. The great Hogarth had established an art academy in St Martin's Lane, one of the first of its kind in England. Here, Hogarth and other leading artists of the age, such as Francis Heyman and Hubert Gravelow, could nurture and encourage the next generation of great painters, including Gainsborough. When Gainsborough entered the St Martin's Lane Academy, his teacher there was a, a man called Hubert Gravelow, and uh, he'd come from France and was able to bring into Gainsborough an understanding of French and foreign uh, influences. And I think that Gainsborough learned a great deal of the, the, the rather more elegant Rococo style that had begun to become established in France. Probably the first thing he actually learnt at the academy itself was drawing. Uh, the main activity of the academy, like most academies in those days, was drawing from the live human figure. It is perhaps a rather surprising thing that uh, there don't seem to be many nudes by Gaines for uh, drawing, uh, but he presumably must have drawn from the living model at that time. He basically learned Rococo design, which he did use in some of his early pictures. They're, they're rather sort of small pictures of men and women sitting on banks, streams and things like that. Gravelo himself actually wasn't a particularly good artist. He's not really a very well uh, noted artist. But what he is good at uh, is, is introducing this link between the, the English and the, the French styles at the time. And so I think that this really launched Gainsborough on his career into the kind of painting that, that really started to make his name. By the age of 18, Gainsborough was experienced and confident enough to establish his own studio. The young artist managed to scrape a living from small portraits and book illustrations. His work also included touching up European landscape paintings for sale in the London art market. But these were not landscapes in the established picturesque manner of Poussin. Instead, they were the subtly different paintings of the Dutch landscapists, such as Jacob van Rijsdale. The Dutch landscape painting, which was from the 17th century, all came out of the, what, what's known as the Dutch topographical tradition. And this is a very naturalistic form of painting. And whilst the, the landscapes were not entirely direct transcriptions of nature, it had a very uh, naturalistic view of the world. And that whole idea pervaded Dutch painting and Dutch landscape painting throughout the 17th century. Gainsborough's first interest in landscape seems to have been stimulated by Dutch painting. 
Possibly a reason for this is because he came from East Anglia and there were still very strong trading links with Holland and a lot of Dutch painting was accessible to him uh, from childhood upwards. To a certain extent, these people were painting a landscape not very different from East Anglia, uh, rather flat, woody areas, and this is perhaps something else that interested Gainsborough. He seems to have had a particular interest in the work of Roysdale, who is a painter who specialises in doing scenes of woods. And perhaps equally important, uh, he is a painter who has a wonderful sense of mood in his landscapes, uh, the way in which he can represent these cloudy landscapes in which you can see a mixture of light and dark and the very sort of dramatic effects. And this is something one notices in Gainsborough's early landscapes. They're very close to Roysdale, not just in the way that they represent everyday nature, so to speak, the local woods and trees around Sudbury where he lived, but also because of the particular kind of mood that he gives them, which is so close to Royasdale. The most famous example of the Dutch school's influence on Gainsborough is this landscape, completed around 1747, a painting known simply as Gainsborough's Forest. Typical of the Dutch style is the scattering of human figures throughout the scene, a feature which is known as staffage. Unfortunately for Gainsborough, the market for English landscape paintings was non-existent. Only as a portraitist could an English artist make a good living. But the art market in England was slowly beginning to change, thanks to Hogarth. He wanted to improve the status of English art as a whole, and in the 1740s he came up with a scheme to do just that. This is the Thomas Coram Foundation in London, formerly known as the Foundling Hospital. In 1739, it was founded by Thomas Coram, a man who sat for this memorable Hogarth portrait the following year. Hogarth saw his opportunity and proposed an elaborate decoration for the hospital. A series of paintings created by the greatest English artists of the day. These included a 21-year-old Gainsborough, who contributed this roundel image of the Charter House, another famous London hospital. The influence of Dutch landscape painting has crept in again, but Gainsborough also reveals the influence of Hogarth in his use of oil paint. Landscape commissions demanded this accuracy, and this is how the Charter House looked. But Gainsborough's greatest landscape paintings would not depict any place that you could find on a map. His greatest landscapes would be the product of his imagination. I think Gainsborough's view of landscape really was um, rather more about his own personal feelings for it, rather than purely being somebody who recorded the topographical designs of what the landscape was, was about. He wanted to project his own poetical views onto it. It seems to gradually take place in the 1750s when he is in Ipswich. I think to some extent he was influenced by the, should we say, the, the common view of art at the time, which believed that ideal art was better than the imitation of the everyday. And you might say, as Gainsborough himself goes up market, so he thinks it's more important to paint ideal landscape and not everyday landscape. He used a very realistic landscape early on in his career. Um, in the 1740s, when he was little more than about 25, he would um, really be very topographical in his approach to landscape. But once that he'd learnt those particular elements, definitely his drawings indicate that he looked at individual things and worked those up and understood how they worked. And then in the second half of the 1750s, when he was in his um, early 30s, he would start to put those elements together into a composition that gave him satisfaction. Gainsborough's individual approach to landscape subject matter meant that he would have to rely on portraiture if he was to survive as an artist. But if we look at this 1749 portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, there is no doubt that Gainsborough paid as much attention to the setting as to the sitters.
This attention to background occurs in Artist and Wife, an image which reveals more than the influence of French Rococo. The general consensus is that this is Thomas Gainsborough himself, sitting in an Arcadian setting alongside Margaret Burr, the woman who became his wife in 1746. It would be a marriage that would last until death, and Margaret bore her husband two daughters. In the 1750s, times were hard for them, and they returned to Gainsborough's home county of Suffolk. Gainsborough was forced to search hard for portrait commissions, which paid very little. This is John Plampin, a wealthy resident of Suffolk, painted by Gainsborough in 1754. The landscape is wonderfully painted, but the figure of Plampin himself is less impressive. The legs are very unnatural. When painting bodies, Gainsborough often relied on using a jointed doll, particularly in his early career. This was a device which Hubert Gravelow, one of his tutors at St Martin's, had introduced him to. The figures that resulted on the canvas often appear stilted and strange, as in this image of Heneage Lloyd and his sister, also painted in the 1750s. Gainsborough does seem to be rather stiff in his drawing of his early works. It makes one wonder how much time he did actually spend at the St Martin's Academy uh, studying the figure. Perhaps it wasn't too long. Uh, you do see in his early portraits this very stiff, doll-like look. It may also, of course, be partly fashion. We know that with Devis, for instance, that he painted in the figures from jointed dolls, and there are even some costumes that went on his jointed dolls, unbelievably. Um, and uh, he painted those in and then added the heads later once he got a commission, which seems to be a funny way of going around it, but I suppose it speeded up the process. These paintings were not really painted outside in the open air, so that when he painted a portrait or a figure of somebody, um, like, like the painting of John Plampin, for example, this painting was actually done in the studio, and then the landscape was then added afterwards. Despite his weakness in painting human figures, Gainsborough was developing into a true master of depicting the human face. Here, the artist's two daughters, Margaret and Mary, are captured in a moment of time chasing a butterfly. This is one of many child portraits painted by Gainsborough in the course of his career. The demand for portraits of children was on the increase, and Gainsborough made the most of it. His landscapes began to develop an elegance, derived from the Rococo school of painting. But it did not alter the fact that there was simply very little market for images such as river landscape with rustic lovers. But if Gainsborough ever felt any sense of frustration, he did not allow it to affect his work. This is a self-portrait of the artist in his early thirties and there is certainly no frustration or bitterness here. Instead, it is a confident image, the work of an artist whose ability to depict the face was already of the highest class. Throughout his career, Gainsborough took great pains over the faces of his portraits. He always insisted on painting the whole face with the sitter physically present in the studio. This was an approach which was unusual for the day and could cause delays in completing commissions for busy patrons. Gainsborough's methods paid off and this self-portrait is a good example of the personality that characterizes his finest portrait work. This is a man who is conscious of his powers and aware of imminent fame and fortune. As events turned out, that is exactly what happened. But Gainsborough would have to leave Suffolk in order to achieve this great success. In 1759, he moved his family to the English city that had become the social phenomenon of the age, the city of Bath. It was a wise move. At the time, the spa city of Bath was hugely popular with English society.
the health benefits of the spa waters attracted the rich and noble from all over the country. But a visit to the city baths was just one feature of an exhilarating social calendar pioneered by the famous dandy Beau Nash. Every day in Bath was a non-stop round of parties, dinners and dances. In this climate of leisure, having one's portrait painted was also a popular diversion, and Gainsborough took advantage of this. His years in Bath mark the beginning of his mature portrait style, and full-length portraits were now Gainsborough's most popular commission. When Gainsborough moved to Bath, he uh, rented the largest house he could find, just to the west of the Abbey, and he took in paying guests. So he was a landlord for a while. Eventually his sister came down and opened her haberdashers come um, milliner's shop down below. But this house gave him a huge studio, and he was therefore that much more able to paint full-length portraits. Bath was the place where people went in the summer uh, to take the water. And so he, there were lots of quite aristocratic people there, and there was a gap in the market for portraiture. It's only when he starts attracting, shall we say, a grander clientele, people from the local gentry and things like that, that you'll find there were people who were prepared to pay him to do a full-length portrait. So I think the arrival of full-length portraiture in his work round about 1758, we think, is really a reflection of the fact he's now getting a better class of client. Gainsborough then uh, decided that he wanted to move into that area of portraiture because, partly because it, it, it fulfilled uh, um, the demands from his clientele. Many painters at the time had this, this sense where they wanted to prove to their clients and to the world at large that they were just as good as, as some famous predecessor. And, and I think this gave Gainsborough very much the opportunity to do that. Portraits from this period made Gainsborough wealthy and he was eventually able to afford a property in one of Bath's finest residential areas, the circus. His social status was rising, and his art was also growing in stature. The connections he made in Bath led to invitations to view the large private art collections that were a feature of so many great houses. As a result, he saw firsthand the portraiture of Anthony van Dyck. The influence of the great Flemish artist soon began to show in Gainsborough's work in full-length portraits, such as this depiction of Anne Ford. The Flemish influence grew stronger as Gainsborough developed his new style in canvases such as Mary, Countess Howe. She's wearing this uh, beautiful pink gown with a, a sort of muslin apron over the top. And um, she's out of doors, and so it's been ruffled a little bit by the wind. So um, that was one aspect of, of Van Dyck's technique which he, uh, which he certainly adapted. When Gainsborough comes to Bath and he's really trying to move into a grander mode altogether, this is when you find he's really beginning to look at Van Dyck in detail. He knows about him beforehand, but he looks at him in detail. He's able to see Van Dyck's in some of the grand country houses around, and this is when he really thinks about how can he adapt Van Dyck for his own painting. The portrait of the Countess of Howe, which personally I think is his finest portrait, um, shows that to a very great degree. The way she stands, the whole sort of elegance of her, relates back to that elegance of Van Dyck and the beautiful painting of the fabrics, all those wonderful silks and satins, very much the kind of thing that Van Dyck emphasised. And Gainsborough has really managed to pick up a similar kind of quality and elegance uh, in the way that he portrays that. So I think that whole mood, shall we say, is something that he seems to take from Van Dyck. What Van Dyck did for the 17th century, um, Gainsborough really did for the 18th century. And his, his technique, the way how he handled the paint, was a very delicate, rather feathery sort of technique. Um, and I think that this sort of um, brilliant, rather bravura style that, that Van Dyck had, uh, had adopted, which, which epitomises um, 17th century portraiture, um, became characteristic of Gainsborough in the 18th century.
If Gainsborough's portraiture was now influenced by Van Dyck, then his landscape painting in Bath took much of its inspiration from Van Dyck's master, Rubens. This is The Harvest Wagon, painted by Gainsborough in 1767. The layout of the peasant figures on the cart mirrors the figure layout of Rubens' Descent from the Cross. He was obviously interested in this composition um, and what he learnt from it was the combination of the figures and there are echoes of it, though I would never like to say that this was a study for it, in some figures on the back of a harvest wagon in a landscape that's now in the Barber Institute in Birmingham. Um, I think that whereas Italian painters tend to make drawings and they eventually develop into a painting, Gainsborough was rather unlike that because of that extraordinary ability he had of visual memory. He would think along parallel lines rather than a long, um, a linear <laughs> method of thinking. Gainsborough was passionate about Rubens' work and its influence began to permeate all his new landscape work. Rubens, particularly towards the later end of his life, moved very much into painting landscapes so that for the last ten years of his life Rubens was was very much a landscape painter. And his paintings have a wonderful glowing rich quality where the colour seems to shine out of them. And one sees very often things like sunsets and rainbows and effects like this. This I think is something that impressed Gainsborough. He wanted to give a similar sense of life and a similar sense of integration, one might say, um, to his work. He tended to take over something of the compositional structure of those Rubens landscapes to giving them a kind of breadth that you find. Um, the colour is rather different. Rubens tends to use rather brighter colours uh, than Gainsborough. Gainsborough's colours tend to be darker, a little bit more sombre, a little bit more wistful, but they are definitely based on those wonderful late landscapes of Rubens. This river landscape from the late 1760s derives its entire structure from a Rubens landscape painted a century and a half before. The influence of Rubens on Gainsborough's mature landscape painting matched that of Van Dyck and his mature portrait manner. Despite these strong influences, Gainsborough's art had a personality all of its own. His portraits are characterised by a sense of unity across the canvas, a result of painting the entire work at once. Gainsborough also chose to depict his sitters in contemporary clothing. This later portrait was modified by the artist to make the young lady's clothing more up to date. Gainsborough's working methods were unusual, but perhaps his distinctive feature is his application of paint to the canvas. Using highly thinned oils, he developed the so-called feathery style of brushwork. Gainsborough's later portrait painting, particularly paintings like uh, Mrs. Siddons, the Honourable Mrs. Siddons, um, have this uh, incredibly delicate feathery quality to them. Um, and Gainsborough was able to overlay the paint very, almost like in fine veils, one on top of the other. Um, so that he was able to bring out the texture of materials uh, in, in a very soft, uh, elegant sort of way. I think that Gainsborough developed this broader way of painting uh, very deliberately, and I think it was very much his signature. You might say that it was his way of establishing his individuality. He was showing he could paint in a way that was different from other people, that was very recognisable. Um, he liked using long brush strokes because I think it gave a tremendous sense of elegance. As his career went on, and perhaps particularly after he started exhibiting, he wanted to emphasize this particular cachet that he had of being able to get these wonderful elegant effects with these amazingly bold brush strokes. By the end of the 1760s, Gainsborough was charging a hundred guineas for a full-length portrait, and although his landscape still struggled to find buyers, he was now one of Bath's most eminent residents. He had also become a founding member of London's new Royal Academy 
an institution whose president was Gainsborough's only rival for the mantle of greatest English portraitist, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Reynolds and Gainsborough were complete opposites. Reynolds believed in painstaking study of the old masters, whilst Gainsborough's art was far more instinctive. The two men became rivals, and it annoyed Gainsborough that Reynolds received more official recognition of his artistic talents, his knighthood being just one example. Despite their rivalry, these two great English portraitists had to respect each other's abilities. There was great rivalry between Reynolds and Gainsborough. It was almost inevitable. Both of them wanted to be the top portrait painter in Britain, and being the top portrait painter in Britain was an extremely lucrative thing to achieve in those days when people would pay more money for portraiture than they would for anything else. It also gave you great social status. It meant you were a society painter. I don't think they liked each other very, very much, and in particular, Gainsborough um, was, was very much liked by the royal family, and... Um, he was asked to paint their portraits on several occasions, whereas uh, the royal family didn't like Reynolds at all. <laughs> so, um, so they had this slightly ambiguous attitude towards, towards each other. I think Reynolds was reasonably um, competitive with Gainsborough, whereas I think that Gainsborough himself didn't really uh, feel that that was something that he was particularly concerned about. I think the reason, perhaps, was because Gainsborough knew that he was an infinitely better painter than Reynolds was, uh, and, uh, and so he was far more relaxed about it than, than, than Reynolds was. Um, and I think that probably that actually drove Reynolds crazy, really, because um, Reynolds um, knew that, that this man was um, by far the best painter of his day. I'm not sure that it's helpful to think that um, one artist was better than the other. And Gainsborough and Reynolds approached um, their work in, from totally, utterly, diametrically opposed directions. They have, in many respects, very little in common. They both, they regarded each other with a healthy respect, um, but a complete misunderstanding. So Gainsborough said of Reynolds, damn him how various he is. Um, which was as much a comment about Gainsborough as it was about Reynolds. Gainsborough was obviously very conscious of the fact that his compositions weren't as varied as Reynolds. The most famous Gainsborough of all is associated with the artist's great rival Reynolds. For two centuries, it has been widely believed that Reynolds argued against the use of blue as the main colour in a painting and that Gainsborough decided to defy him by painting this timeless canvas, The Blue Boy. It is a well-told tale, but the known facts fail to confirm it. That idea that colours recede and become more bluish as, as one goes further into the distance, aerial perspective, started to become a, a rule in painting, so that the ideas uh, were that warmer colours, browns and golds and things, should become part of the foreground colours, and the cooler colours, blues and greens, uh, should gradually become used and reserved, really, for the colours in the, in the background. And Reynolds, rather, uh, began to teach this as almost a fixed rule that one had to obey in one's painting. This was a challenge to Gainsborough, and he painted this boy completely in blue, in, in a Van Dyck um, costume. He was actually the son of... Um, um, of a, I think a farrier. So he wasn't a very elevated sort of boy at all, but um, nevertheless this, this picture did disprove what Reynolds had said and has become quite famous ever, ever since. As far as we know, um, Gainsborough's Blue Boy, as it's now called, Gainsborough himself did not call it the Blue Boy. Uh, he was just a portrait of a gentleman. Um, he exhibited this in 1770. Now, the remark in the Reynolds discourse was not made until 1778, so there's no way he could have been painting that picture to rebut that theory. The story that he painted it to rebut the theory isn't found until 1820, about 30 years after Gainsborough's death. So it does seem as though this is an invented story that was really 
embroidered out of the knowledge of the rivalry. The Blue Boy is a portrait of Jonathan Buttle, a young man whose family had connections in Ipswich. Jonathan became a good friend of Gainsborough, and it appears that the artist painted this famous image for his own purposes, not as a commission. Gainsborough may have preferred contemporary dress for his portrait subjects, but here he decided to experiment with the kind of clothing seen in the great works of Van Dyck. This dramatic clothing is the most memorable feature of the canvas. The strength of the young man's posture and the way he seems to be in charge of the brooding yet harmonious landscape is impressive. It remains a giant image of English art. He was wearing a sort of satiny fabric, and so the lights on this fabric were reflected th throughout the picture. If he'd been wearing something bl like wool, then it, it would have sunk into the, you know, he wouldn't been able to see it very well, but um, he does stand, and also he's stand standing outside, so the light is reflected again off his, off his costume, so it does look quite real, I think. It was simply so brilliantly painted, uh, and, and it's such an elegant and, and notable image. It's a very, very recognisable image, uh, and that be became the, the, the central core for the painting, uh, and it became the, the most famous painting of its day when he painted it. In 1773, a disagreement did take place between Gainsborough and the Royal Academy, led by his arch-rival, Gainsborough was unhappy with the hanging arrangements for his paintings at that year's Academy exhibition, so he simply withdrew from the show. It would be four years before he returned. But the dispute hardly affected his career. In 1774, he returned to London and bought a property on the fashionable Pall Mall. With him was the only pupil that he ever took under his wing, his nephew, Gainsborough Dupont, here depicted in one of his uncle's most intensely personal portraits. As a rule, Gainsborough's paintings were all his own work, including the painting of the sitter's costume, a task that many other portraitists left to their students. Gainsborough's studio technique was also unusual. He, he liked to stand the same distance from the canvas as from his sitter. As a result, he was spotted using brushes attached to sticks some six feet in length. He also preferred to work using a very low level of candlelight. Gainsborough does seem to have developed quite an unusual painting technique. It seems to be remarkable, um, first of all, because of his great interest in getting a likeness, uh, which was such a principal point of him. And one of his most unusual features was to paint with brushes, and I still find this hard to believe myself, that were actually on poles six foot long. And the reason for this was because he wanted to have the canvas and the sitter at exactly the same distance from him and he would actually place his canvas immediately beside the sitter and then he would paint looking at the sitter's face and then painting it so that he could have he could watch the two very close together there was an argument early on in one of his letters which said that the flickering of the candlelight the flickering of the brush strokes gave the portrait animation and the most difficult thing that a portrait painter had to do was to freeze a face was to give it no animation at all um, and we've all looked at photographs and thought, oh, well, that looks like so-and-so. And if you ask the person who's in the photograph, they'll probably choose another photograph as to how they think they look. Um, and so once you're affected by that as a portrait painter, that you're only able to have one go at that rather than a series of photographs of yourself, then you can see that lightness and that flickering lightness is really quite important. Gainsborough's studio technique may have been different, but the results were lucrative. His portrait painting made him a wealthy man, whilst his landscape painting still could not sell. The critics raved over The Watering Place, painted in 1777, yet it remained unsold. The literary figure Horace Walpole 
described this image as the finest ever landscape painted in England. At the time, he was probably right. The watering place was one of the works displayed by Gainsborough when he returned to the Royal Academy in 1777, and the whole exhibition was a triumph for him. Amongst his portraits on show was this image of Karl Friedrich Abel, a noted musician and good friend of Gainsborough. As well as painting Karl Abel, Johann Christian Bach sat for a Gainsborough portrait. Gainsborough's family were also subjects for his portraits. This is Mrs Gainsborough in 1778, a masterful study of late Middle Age. It is an image full of meaning. There is tenderness, but also a sense of sadness and a perceptible sense of distance. After 30 years of marriage, Margaret Gainsborough is still her own woman and her husband has captured this. Gainsborough at the time was famed for his ability to capture a likeness and that's what he felt was the most important thing in a portrait. I think he painted faces extremely well and accurately. Sometimes he enhanced ladies' faces. He was very keen to paint ladies. Um, and so he perhaps made them look better than they really, really did. I think it's, it's, it's well known and well recognised and, and uh, I think uh, nobody would dispute that Gainsborough was one of the greatest portraitists who, who, who's ever lived. And this refined technique that he brought to portraiture um, gave his paintings an elegance that really simply was unsurpassed in the 18th century and something that, that his contemporaries simply couldn't attain to. Gainsborough's insistence on painting the human face with a sitter present did lead to some problems. His more eminent clients were often busy people who found it difficult to keep returning to the artist's studio. Portrait commissions were sometimes slow to be delivered. This image of Queen Charlotte had to be completed in one night by Gainsborough and his nephew after the king himself complained. Despite this, Gainsborough's relationship with the court was good, and he received many commissions from the royal family, such as the three elder daughters of George III, the three princesses. In 1784, this was one of Gainsborough's paintings for the Academy exhibition. Once again, he was unhappy with how the Academy intended to hang the work. The resulting dispute led Gainsborough to withdraw all his works from the Royal Academy. He would never exhibit there again. Gainsborough had a very stormy relationship with the Royal Academy and this led finally in 1784 with him removing his pictures and vowing never to exhibit there again. On this particular occasion, uh, there were some portraits of the royal princesses which he set great store of because he was very proud of his connection with royalty and he wanted these to be hung low down enough. He said if they were hung more than five and a half feet from the ground they wouldn't be seen. Now the academy hangers hung them too high and so therefore he took them out and that was it. But there may have been an even more precise reason which is that at this point uh, the king's painter Alan Ramsay had died and the job was up and Gainsborough was hoping to get the job. Now actually later in the year Reynolds got the job, but I think that he was particularly sensitive about his work being shown off badly, so I think that's possibly another reason why he withdrew them. We might also reflect that perhaps withdrawing them was the worst thing he could do from the point of view of the king, because he'd shown himself to be a rather petulant person, and the king was probably not very pleased with that. Anyway, one way or another, Reynolds got the job, and Gainsborough vowed never to exhibit in the Academy again. Gainsborough's withdrawal from the Royal Academy made little difference to his life or his art. He simply began to exhibit his work at home, and the commissions continued to flow in. Amongst the best of these later works is this famous and almost romantic painting of Elizabeth Sheridan, wife of the dramatist Richard Sheridan. Other later portraits of note included this far more studious depiction of a good friend, Philip de Lutherberg. <laughs> 
This German painter, who gave Gainsborough the idea of working with transparencies. It was a logical move for an artist who had been strongly concerned with light and shade throughout his career. Inspired by de Lutherberg, Gainsborough created images on glass which would be illuminated by candlelight, using a so-called peep show box. Here we can see the remarkable results with the moonlight landscape of 1782, a scene whose eerie lighting is, again, almost romantic in nature. In the early 1780s, he travelled more widely than he had before, making journeys to England's West Country and Lake District. This latter trip inspired the incorporation of mountain scenery into the artist's landscape work. Gainsborough also brought an occasional narrative quality to his later canvases, as with this scene, showing two dogs fighting whilst two shepherd boys look on. The differing reaction of these youths to what is becoming a fight to the death is another example of Gainsborough's ability to express character. But of all Gainsborough's later works, it is his so-called fancy paintings that are his greatest achievement. As he neared the end of his life, he now combined the two branches of his art in a new kind of painting. Landscape and portraiture came together in images such as the girl with picture. This is not a portrait intended to be hung in the home of a wealthy commissioner. It is a peasant girl who cannot be divorced from the wonderful rusticity of the landscape. This kind of work had never been attempted before, and the fancy paintings represent the final great achievement of Gainsborough's art. I think Gainsborough had always had very complex um, ideas and feelings about landscape. And so he developed this, this idea of the fancy painting, which rather uh, uh, integrated ideas of landscape and portraiture and genre painting. Um, and uh, these paintings nowadays uh, uh, sometimes um, give us this idea of a slightly rose-tinted spectacles view of the world, and the, the, the paintings have a, um, a, a sort of golden, rather um, rosy quality, a, a richness that, that some of his earlier landscape paintings didn't have. He was coming towards the end of his life. He was feeling very much, uh, shall we say, homesick for the countryside. He was living in the centre of London, in, in Pall Mall. Uh, he was the society portrait painter. But he had a country cottage, as a lot of city dwellers do, and he used to go there wherever he could. He was now looking at the landscape as a form of refuge. And in a way, you can see a kind of sense of refuge in these fancy pictures. And I think that's what fired him. And also, I think that's why they were so popular, because that sentimental approach to landscape and to the idea that children in nature could live in this happy way uh, was something immensely appealing to um, urban people. And this is why they were so successful, particularly at that time when there was a growing cult of the natural, the growing interest in looking towards nature as somewhere as a refuge for the city dweller. Girl with Pigs is another example of the Gainsborough fancy painting. It is, first and foremost, a simple scene, and there is no point in searching for a narrative or moral element. It is a straightforward depiction of a peasant girl looking on as two pigs drink from a bowl. This kind of everyday rural scene had never been before considered a worthy subject matter for high art. This is almost a history painting, except that there is no great historical or biblical event taking place, and there is certainly no sense of narrative or teaching. Fancy pictures like this are just ordinary rural scenes, and they proved amongst the most popular works of Gainsborough's career. I think more than, more than um, some of his other paintings, which were done um, for commercial reasons, uh, I think that, that his fancy paintings were very much done for his own personal um, interest. And they do form a major part of his later work and, and of his ideas about uh, his relationship to landscape. 
So they are a, a fairly uh, major and, and, and important part of his work as a whole. I don't personally like them. I think he tried to make people think of them as being rather sentimental, which uh, I, I, I feel they really weren't. So I think it's a personal opinion, really. And, and of course, opinions about art change throughout the years. So it may well be that in the future they are more light than the portraits. One doesn't really know. Girl with Pigs was painted and sold in the year 1782. The buyer considered it to be the best work of Gainsborough's career. The purchaser's name was Sir Joshua Reynolds, and the price was 100 guineas. In the final years of his life, the fancy paintings would make Gainsborough even more wealthy. But from 1785 onwards, the artist knew that he did not have long to enjoy his prosperity. That year, Gainsborough's health began to fail. As he lay on his deathbed, Thomas Gainsborough requested the presence of his old rival Reynolds, and the Royal Academy president rushed to his bedside. In an emotional final meeting between the two great portraitists, Gainsborough lamented the end of his life as being a tragedy only in the sense that it also meant the end of his art. Any rivalry between the two men was now forgotten, and following Gainsborough's death on August the 2nd, 1788, Reynolds paid his old rival the greatest possible compliment. He devoted the whole of his subsequent annual Academy speech to the praise of Thomas Gainsborough. His words are worth remembering. They provide a powerful final recognition of the work of one of the greatest painters ever produced by his nation. If ever this nation should produce genius sufficient to acquire to us the honourable distinction of an English school, the name of Gainsborough will be transmitted to posterity among the very first of that rising name. I think that, that um, Gainsborough, as a portrait painter, I mean, he was, he was by far the, the, the greatest portrait painter, I think, that Britain's ever produced. And I think that he was the greatest painter of the 18th century that Britain has ever produced. As an artist on the world stage, I mean, he, he ranks completely alongside all of his European contemporaries. And I think, really, is one of the very few British artists who, who could be classed as a world-class artist in his own right. Gainsborough painted quite a lot of aristocratic people, including the king and the queen and 13 children. And uh, you see his portraits all over the world, really, wherever you go. There's usually, in, in the main gallery, there is a Gainsborough hanging up there. So um, I think he flew the flag for uh, British portraiture in a very big way. That idea of a painter being primarily a painter, wanting to paint, enjoying painting, seeing painting as being their world, that is something new in Britain at this time. And in a way, you might say in that sense, he is really important for establishing the ability of British artists to paint and to enjoy and revel in the whole action of painting uh, in a way that no other British artist had done before. He is very much a painter and he influences other people by that quality of painting. And I think you might say, in that sense, he set a practice of painting going in Britain in a way that was quite unique.